On this edition of Manned Space, we journey to the moon with the crew of Apollo 10 and come to within 50,000 feet of the lunar surface. On March 11, 1969, a giant Saturn V rocket rolled out of the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center. Destined to carry the crew of Apollo 10 on the second manned flight to the moon, it first had to complete the four-mile transport to Launch Pad 39B. Apollo 10's planned launch from Pad 39B would mark the first time the pad was used. The commander of Apollo 10 was Thomas Stafford. In 1965, Stafford was aboard Gemini 6 when it rendezvoused with Gemini 7. He returned to space on June 3, 1966 as commander of Gemini 9. The command module pilot was John Young. Young had flown aboard the first flight of the Gemini program and had also commanded Gemini 10. Lunar module pilot Gene Cernan rounded out the crew of space flight veterans. He too had ridden aboard Gemini 9 with Stafford. We'll go on internal power with the launch vehicle at the 50 second mark. At 17 seconds in the count of the guidance system goes internal. This is guidance reference release. We already have the proper flight azimuth in. Now 90 seconds and counting. Now 90 and counting. The astronauts have turned off their ground communication at this time. However, they are on uh, VHF and, of course, the SBN circuits as well as the special astronaut communication circuit. One minute, 12 seconds and counting. The vehicle tanks beginning to pressurize at this time. Our status board indicates that the third stage tanks are now pressurized. We're coming up on the 60-second mark. 60 seconds and counting. We are go for a mission to the moon at this time. The second stage tanks now pressurizing, and we're coming up on the power transfer. 50 seconds and counting. We've now switched to internal power satisfactorily on the batteries uh, of the first stage. We're all three stages of the Saturn V vehicle. 40 seconds and counting. Tom Stafford making a final check of his computer. The vehicle... Uh, all our stages pressurized at this time. We're waiting for the swing arms to come back. One uh, should be coming back at this time, the second one at 17 seconds. Tom Stafford reports they are go. They're coming up at the 20 second mark. T minus 20 seconds and counting. 17 seconds and counting. Guidance internal. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on, five, four, three, two, five, engines running. Thank you. 
Inboard engines are out. Good stage in the right left. Roger. Good ignition on the second stage. Man, that stage is quite a sequence. All right, sounded like it. And we have guidance initiating. We confirm that, Ken. Uh, Roger. Yes, it's looking beautiful, Tom. Everything's so pathetic. Uh, Roger. Uh, you're a go. Trajectory and guidance look good. Uh, Roger. We look right on the line on board. 171 miles downrange, 67 miles high at 4 minutes 15 seconds. Still go. Glenn Lenny taking a status check. Everyone says go. 4 minutes 50 seconds, 230 miles downrange, 76 miles high. Ken Houston, at 5 minutes, you're all go. All your systems are looking great. On May 18, 1969, approximately 12 minutes after launch, the crew of Apollo 10 achieved Earth orbit. For the next two and a half hours, mission control is on the ground and the astronauts in the spacecraft continued monitoring the vehicle systems in preparation for translunar injection, or TLI, the maneuver that would put Apollo 10 on a course for the moon. Uh, Roger, 10. Uh, your go for TLI. Uh, S4B is looking as planned. Engineer says the Saturn is go. In seconds, for only the second time in history, a manned spacecraft would break free from Earth's bonds and head out toward the moon. We're good. Acceleration. Roger. We're burning. Roger, burning. We're on the way. Uh, Roger, we confirm. Seco! Roger, Seco. With the announcement of Seco, Apollo 10 had successfully completed the TLI burn. They were now on their way to the moon. The next critical step in the flight of Apollo 10 was transposition, docking, and ejecting of the lunar module. The maneuver had been successfully performed in Earth orbit by the crew of Apollo 9, but Apollo 10 would mark the first time the maneuver would be done while traveling to the moon. Apparently we can't be more than about 5, 10 feet away. Roger. Uh, Ken, it's looking real stable to us. We show you closing filing. Doctor, in a second, I hope. Roger. Snap, snap, and we're there. Got two grays. Roger. You saw the docket, Charlie. Get any master alarm. Everything looks snug. Roger. With the live television audience tuned in, the command module the crew named Charlie Brown had successfully captured the lunar module it called Snoopy. With this view of the Earth, it uh, looks like the United States, the landmass of the U.S., is showing up better now than it was a few months ago. As the crew of Apollo 10 continued on its journey to the moon, they took to television once more, this time beaming back pictures of a shrinking Earth and describing what they saw. All right, uh, Bruce, uh, you can really see them. Looks like the New England states are kind of clobbered in there. All right. But uh, the main part of it is coming in real good. Again, you can see the Great American Desert, the Rocky Mountains, the Sierra Nevada there. Soon, the three astronauts settled in for the trip to the moon. As Stafford would later recall, living aboard Apollo, especially with the lunar module, was far easier than living on Gemini. By the end of the first day, the crew of Apollo 10 was nearly 23,000 miles from Earth and advancing rapidly toward the moon. Day two of the mission would see Lunar Module pilot Gene Cernan enter the Lunar Module Snoopy. In his book, We Have Capture, Stafford recalls seeing Cernan return from Snoopy covered with white flecks of insulation. According to Stafford, a Mylar cover attached to a hatch door had torn, releasing a cloud of white fiberglass. He later worried that the crew was forced to breathe it in. Shortly before the second day of the mission concluded, the crew of Apollo 10 was over 135,000 nautical miles from Earth, traveling toward the moon at over 4,400 feet per second. The crew spent much of day three preparing for the next major event on the flight plan, lunar orbit insertion scheduled to occur at 76 hours ground elapsed time. A mid-course correction burn scheduled for this day was canceled. Apollo 10's trajectory was so accurate, the burn was deemed unnecessary. The crew was 150,000 miles from Earth, a mere 1.15 miles off course. Day 4 began with Apollo 10 mere hours from the moon. Soon it would pass behind the moon's western rim, and if all went as planned, re-emerge in lunar orbit. Apollo 10, Houston, uh, two minutes to LOS. Uh... 
Everybody here says Godspeed. Okay, and we'll see you right on the other side in orbit. Uh, Roger. While the crew was on the far side of the moon, the spacecraft's engine fired to slow the vehicle and the crew entered lunar orbit. Hello, Apollo 10, Houston, over. Uh, Roger, Houston, Apollo 10, you can tell the world that we have arrived. Roger. With the crew safely in orbit, the three astronauts did another television transmission describing for people back home the view of the moon. We caught a couple of real pretty little volcanoes, there's no doubt about them. And it still looks kind of brownish gray to us here. There was one volcano, or whatever it was, that it was all white on the outside, but definitely black around the top of it. Charlie, it might sound corny, but the view is really out of this world. Before bedding down for another rest period, Cernan would make a final check of Snoopy to be sure it was ready for its big show the following day. Following breakfast on May 22nd, Cernan and Stafford entered the lunar module during the 12th revolution of the moon a little more than 98 hours into the flight. Soon, Charlie Brown and Snoopy would undock, and with John Young still in the command module, Cernan and Stafford would take the lunar module down toward the lunar surface. This is Apollo Control at 100 hours, 23 minutes, 2 minutes, 23 seconds away from acquiring Snoopy. Oh, Houston, Houston, this is Snoopy. Roger, Snoop, go ahead. It's going, we is down among us, Charlie. Roger, I hear you weaving your way up the freeway. As Snoopy raced across the lunar landscape, it reached its closest point to the moon near the Sea of Tranquility, the future landing site of Apollo 11. Knowing that Neil Armstrong might soon fly an approach to the Sea of Tranquility, Stafford described the landing site in as much detail as he could. He reported the site appeared more smooth than first thought. Stafford and Cernan looped around the moon once more, taking Snoopy to its highest altitude before again swooping down over the Sea of Tranquility where the pair would jettison the vehicle's descent stage and fire the ascent engine to simulate a launch from the lunar surface, a skill necessary to complete a lunar landing mission. As the two prepared for the maneuver, Cernan flipped a switch activating one of Snoopy's two radar systems. Moments later, Stafford threw the same switch unaware Cernan had already done so, thereby deactivating the system. The mistake became immediately evident when the descent stage was jettisoned. As Cernan later described, Snoopy was suddenly bouncing, diving, and spinning all over the place. Cernan recounted seeing the lunar surface corkscrew through the window. The vehicle was totally out of control. The spacecraft's radar, which should have been seeking out Charlie Brown, was instead locked on the moon. Fifteen seconds after the event began, Stafford took over manual operation of Snoopy and regained control. A later analysis of the data related to the incident indicated Stafford and Cernan were two seconds from crashing onto the lunar surface. With the work of flying Snoopy complete, and with the vehicle back under control, it was time for the two men to reunite with Charlie Brown. Hey Joe, uh, we're about ready to dock. Chris John, you're into about five feet, mate. Looking beautiful. Oh, we, we got him. Stop that butt off. We got him, John. We heard him in here. Hello, Houston. Snoopy and Charlie Brown are hugging each other. <laughs> Roger that. We heard him down here. Twelve hours since entering Snoopy, Stafford and Cernan were now back inside Charlie Brown. As the crew dipped behind the moon, Snoopy was jettisoned into an orbit around the sun. Following a well-deserved nine-hour sleep period, the crew would continue orbiting the moon, photographing potential landing sites. Then, 137 hours since launching from the Kennedy Space Center, and 60 hours since arriving in lunar orbit, John Young fired the service propulsion system, setting the crew on a course back to Earth. Hello, Houston, Apollo 10. Hello, Apollo 10, this is Houston. How'd the burn go? Uh, Roger, Houston, we are returning to the Earth. Over. Glad to have you on the way back home, 10. On the way back home, the crew of Apollo 10 took part in another American space first, becoming the first crew to successfully shave in space. Concerns about astronauts cutting themselves in zero-g and whiskers floating in the cabin had deprived previous crews of this luxury. 
Now three hours before re-entry, a final burn of the spacecraft's engine was performed to give the crew the perfect re-entry angle. Get Apollo Control. Apollo 10 just crossing the West Australian coast in a long track toward the splashdown point uh, 350 nautical miles east of Pango Pango, American Samoa. 192 hours, 3 minutes and 23 seconds since liftoff, the crew of Apollo 10 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean within sight of the prime recovery vessel USS Princeton. The way had been cleared for the launch of Apollo 11 just two months later.